Hi, my name is Ryan Peck. And I'm Nicole Barlow. And this is Soundtrack Your Life, where we speak with the guests about a soundtrack that is important to them. Returning to the podcast today is one of the hosts of the Film Rage podcast, Jim. Hey, hey. Welcome back, well, Jim. Well, thanks for having me. I am so excited. I have a feeling this is going to be a, a slurping good time that we're going to have tonight. <laughs> I was almost going to say you were the host of Film Rage. You are one of three. I mean, let's be honest. You're the only important <laughs> well, that, one. Right. We know who the real star is, obviously. It, we're only booking the big yeah, stars. Yeah, well, you know, um, there's a big story about that. But uh, I, I would say, because I'm the only one that does social media, I can say whatever I want because two of them are inept when it comes to anything to do with a computer or a phone or anything technology ridden or they're both like, huh? That's literally what they say, huh? <laughs> uh, so, so Jim, um, for our listeners who may not know what Film Rage is, why don't you let them know about that? Film Rage is a new release in cinema film review podcast for the most part, although we have quite a few segments within our podcast. So we started out actually just wanting to talk about new films and then it just kept we kept adding more segments within our podcast just because we had so many things we wanted to talk about so you know it's almost like you're having a variety show as you listen to one of our episodes so usually it starts out with the actual new releases that come to cinema and we see i would say if it's if we can get the film in cinema in our city we will watch it unless it's one of two things one it's a rom-com or two, it's a kids movie. Like it's intentionally made for kids because it's kind of unfair for us being OGs to review kids movies. It's not really fair, right? And it's not really fair to review rom-coms because they're all terrible and there's never been really a good one except for maybe five in the history of all rom-coms. So, and they're all the same plot. It's mm -hmm. like, there's this really stupid dude who does some stuff that's stupid and then some lady person or, you know, appropriate other person <laughs> that they get together and then something really stupid happens like a three's company plot story. And then they fall in love when they absolutely have no purpose falling in love. And then the ending is also stupid. So that's why we don't review them because that's <laughs> literally the plot of every single one. Because they're stupid. Jim, I would really love for you to tell us on the side what your five acceptable rom-coms are. Wow, that's tough. You know, we we talked a little bit about this the other day, and I think I could only come up with maybe three. So Emily is definitely one. I would say The Princess Bride is, for sure. Oh, like, that's oh. obvious. Does Dorothy's Love of the Scarecrow count as a rom-com? Because <laughs> I want to use Wizard of Oz. Or maybe her love of Toto. Because they seemed a little close Toto for, sure. for my liking, but... I don't know, it's a bit of a romance going on there, maybe. That's, I feel like that's a really, you really pulled those out. That was. I, I normally don't either. Well, I have to really think about stuff. You, it was a thinker for you. So thankfully, the film that we are discussing today and the music from that film that we we're discussing today is not a rom-com. Mm. Not by any means. Isn't it? I don't no, think. There is some rom some in there. There is some there, rom. Yeah. <laughs> there is a little calm. But I don't know that they ever really exist at the same time. Yeah, I would say I would agree with you. Absolutely. There might be a three's company plot in it. <laughs> no. I don't. <laughs> there's, there's three. I, I, I can definitely guarantee that, um, that Jack did not defile a gravestone or a grave once in three's company. So. Maybe not in Canada. Maybe. Yeah, Suzanne Summers did that in the American version. They cut that out oh, for you guys. Oh, maybe we we do get edited <laughs> stuff here. You know, like we I, we have this um, this government control thing being a socialist country that you know you don't get over there <laughs> in in the deep south. Trudeau won't let them see it. So this is a really good uh, segue that if you didn't know from the grave fucking that we are talking about Saltburn today, Jim. Why are we talking about Saltburn today? I think the better question on that, Nicole, is why would we not want to talk about Saltburn, especially when it comes to soundtracks? Because, you know, 
it, it's funny because when I listened to your last episode and I was like that that episode the one about Charlie's Angels if that wasn't the last one I can't remember they're, they're all a blur because they're all fantastic but the in that this one because it's a period piece and you go back and you listen to it and we're, we're obviously going to un- unpack this a little bit as we go through it but the music in this just so fits and it actually this is probably the only soundtrack that I know that actually tells the story of the sh- of the movie itself. If you just listened to the soundtrack and didn't watch the movie, and I feel Nicole might be excited about doing that, just listening to the soundtrack and not rewatching the movie, you literally know what the movie is. Yes, I mean, you do. It's very on the nose. The selections yeah. are very on the nose, and I think they're um, intentionally so. I think Emerald Fennel has talked about how they were intentionally selected to be, to really hit you over the head. Oh, with what that moment there's no saying. subtlety at Matt. whatsoever like it the transition <laughs> from scene to scene with the with the choice of song i mean i i think if you listen to all the lyrics in the songs you're not going to come out of it and go okay now yeah, that makes sense but when you read the title of the song you're going to be like oh yeah that she she nailed it like that's totally yeah. it uh, and, yeah. i mean you actually do this all the time so have you seen a movie that has done it this this pointedly <sighs> that's a really good question ryan is there something else that it's just it's really it's like matched to the scene i'm sure there are other movies that have needle drop moments that are really matched to the action of the scene but i don't know that it's done so as thoroughly as it is in this film and i feel like I feel like maybe there's a couple of reasons for that. I feel like one, if you didn't have some very on the nose and recognizable choices from 2007, you wouldn't know you were in 2007. Mm. I didn't really feel that the main character's, you know, eyebrow piercing was giving me 2007, like all on its own. Eyebrow piercings are not going to do it. I don't know about you, Ryan, as like a someone in my age cohort, but like when MGMT hit, I felt like boomers must feel when you watch a movie from the 60s and they start playing time of the season. I'm like, holy shit, I am so old. Like this is the MGMT is like in a period film. Yeah. And and it's always that song. It's always Always. that song. Time to pretend. It's always time to pretend. Like it's a very commercial sounding song. Like I get it. And it screams 07, screams the odds. But they have... But man, was I disassociated. They had, uh, but they had three solid singles on that album. Like they they should be using more of MGMT everywhere. Oh, I agree. But it is always time to pretend when it's in a movie or in a trailer <laughs> or in a, a commercial or in a, in a commercial for erectile dysfunction in medicine. It's always time to pretend. I don't know if it's actually used in one. I just but assume you know it is. that. that to the point we're trying to make about the soundtrack, that would be perfect for an erectile dysfunction commercial, right? <laughs> to pretend. Time to pretend. Uh, no, this, mo- this movie will make me go limp for a while. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? There's so much wiener in this. Uh, uh. There's so much wiener. I don't think we're going to stop saying the word wiener for the next Ugh. hour. It's just there is an abundance of wiener. I am never tired of saying the word wiener. You don't, you know, and I, you would think that being who I am, I would love a movie with this much full frontal nudity, it, which I appreciated, but it, that, you know, there are a lot of other things that <laughs> this is not soundtrack related, but it is sound related. Before we started the show, I was telling Ryan and Jim, I'm like, when I watch this movie and you get to the bathtub scene, the, like the, everyone knows the bathtub looking scene. What I did not expect was it to sound like Yeah, like just a big slurp. I didn't do it right with my LaCroix. Yeah. I mean, he's not going to like shoot it like like he's got a shot of vodka or something. Well, he's got it. He's going to savor He's got to get I deep. The licking, into that tub. Like, I, I expected the rimming. I didn't expect the slurping. The slurping was a bridge what? too far. What? He had to get every drop. Like, that was the whole point of that <laughs> scene. Is like, there was, it, it would have been better if it was maybe another two minutes longer. That for me would have been like, the pinnacle of of slurp jim's waiting for the extended cut <laughs> yeah. of salt burn that's the direct yeah. cut yeah for sure um maybe he had put it against mgmt yeah but then that 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 kind of what he wasn't pretending anything there he was 
He was getting right in there. He wasn't <laughs> pretending about nothing. A lot of time to pretend. No, no, not at all. Yeah, what's a good 2006 song about slurping? <laughs> Wait, what's um, what's uh, um, crap? The ones, the dudes that sing shots, shot, 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 shot. What that? When did that come out? <laughs> LMFAO, yeah. is when it? did LMFAO? When, when did that song come out? Because that to me would have been perfect, except for it didn't would have held the tone of the the shot. But I mean, imagine that to the yeah. sound of. The... Oh no! Totally. <laughs> to the beat. Too um, good. There, there are a lot of people that are very like prickly about some of the like anachronisms in this film, even though they're like really mild. Like Super Bad didn't come out until late two thousand seven, but I think it captures the spirit of the aughts very well. I think it right? captures the aughts pre like everyone's got a smartphone. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. Plus, I mean the the span of this of the movie does travel almost to a full year if not a longer than a year, right? Because when she meets up with him yeah. in the coffee shop, right? Like, he's like, oh, you've grown up. Like, you have no idea exactly how long that time frame was. So it could have been even two years. They could have thrown in a 2009 song right there. Who knows? Yeah, I think by the time you get to the infamous murder on the dance floor, I've murked everyone, twist ending kind of thing, Um it really could be like from any year. And then they like pull it like way back to Sophia Lester. Mm. Yeah. And as far as like needle drop moments in 2023, I feel like Saltburn and Murder on the Dance Floor is like the big one outside of what the Barbie movie. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. I would say, yeah. Well, it's funny though, or, because or it, peaches. it didn't do huge at the box office, right? Like, it wasn't, I mean, it's talked about, and I think everybody's now gone back and, and viewed it on VOD or, you know, or, or streaming, but I don't, like, in cinemas, I didn't think it crushed it. It was kind of a soft opening yeah. in my in our city. I don't know about, but you guys live in a bigger city, so it probably had, like, 27. How many cinemas do you have, anyway? Like, 8,000? I mean... Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we're in the LA area, so there are Yeah, it's like, cinemas. it's just like, instead of, like, in in Canada, and in particular my city, it's like on every corner there's a liquor store and a weed shop, and then like our cinemas are dying. But in in Hollyweird, you know, you got to have like a movie theater on every corner next to the you know the the weed shop and the and the liquor store. I guess you don't have liquor. The stores. artisanal <laughs> weed shop. Oh, yeah, it's, nice. It's organic over here. Oh. Okay. It's kind of like going to a Starbucks. Like our weed shops are very like Starbucks here. It's just a very yeah. I don't know how it is up in. Up yeah, in you know area. what? It, when it when we le- see we legalize the whole country. Exactly. See, I can't travel across the U.S. with all my weed when I, and I can't even bring my weed across the border. So <laughs> you know that's disappointing in itself. But you know when I go to the places, I usually check pick the states that I can still have my weed there. Right? I mean that makes sense. Why would you go anywhere else? I know there's a safety in that. I'm like, yeah, Washington, yeah, Colorado, yeah, Oregon. I can yeah. go with you. New I'm York's okay cool. There. I, yeah, I can get my weed there too. Yeah, it's all good. But yeah, I, do, I think maybe maybe it's our adjacency to the LA area. Maybe we're too chronically online. But I do feel like there was a pretty big moment. I'm pretty sure that the Spotify streams ratcheted up pretty high for this song. I don't know that we've seen a resurgence of an older song like this since maybe. The Stranger Things mm. moment with yeah, Kate Bush's yeah, yeah. running up that hill it felt, felt very similar, you know, where people were discovering this song and this artist for m- many of them for the first time. So to them, it sounds brand new and super fresh. And I think people stateside, you know, that sort of UK pop didn't necessarily catch fire here in the way that it should have, really. I think like the Brits and the Swedes are way better at pop music. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Yeah. I mean... I guess it depends on what era you're looking at, though, right? Because, you know, late 70s pop was all America, I found. Because they, you know, the Brits found punk first, uh, arguably, I think. I could be wrong, but that's my opinion as I lived through that era. Yeah, I think when you're talking dance hits, like dance hits from like the 90s and the 2000s, 
I think a lot of what we had is that pales in comparison to the things that got um, that that got popular. I mean, like the, the Manchester sound. Like I'll take a Kylie Minogue. I'll take a Kylie Minogue all day over like a Britney Spears. I'm just saying. Like there's the anyway. But it's a like Murder on the Dance Floor is a, it's a banger. I think it's like a deserved newfound hit. It's a cool song, and it gets pretty much like it's almost it gets played in full. Yeah. I think at the end of the movie, yeah. right? I think you're right. Which is rare. Um, what I read about it is that you know you have to call artists and tell them roughly, "Hey, artist, this is what we're gonna do when we use your song. We're gonna have a." Uh, Barry Keegan running n- naked with his dong out in a mansion. Is that fine? <laughs> After he admits that he <laughs> like, killed everybody. That... I mean, the song's called Murder on the Dance Floor. Right. It's like, it's like they couldn't have had a better song at the, to end it with. Like, especially mm-hmm. from that, like, right. if you only got so many songs to pick in. from 2007 and you're going to have, you know, a person that's admitted to murdering everybody and then he's going to dance <laughs> around. I mean, it's like... It's, it's, so right? it's like the, the, but that's the whole soundtrack of this oh. that's why this soundtrack is so beautiful like and every song like every single song there's a couple on there that i didn't even remember but like re-listening to it again i'm like fuck this soundtrack is awesome and i, I don't often say that where i'm like you know what i downloaded i downloaded it the the right after it came out of of the movie theater. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm downloading it right now. I, and that's a sign for me is that is when, when you have that impact that you're seeing the movie and because, you know, movies are, you know, so important to me, but part of movies as you two know very well is that the music and the sound can destroy a film, destroy it. So, you know, when you get that magic moment, I can forgive a lot of things about about movies, but I can't forgive bad music and bad sound in a in it. It's like mm-hmm. there's there's kind of like the trifecta. I can't stand if the actual sound of the actual like the voices isn't clear. The camera has to be a good camera mm-hmm. and the lighting has to be good because if those three things are not working, it's just like I mean, how many times have you seen a movie where it's like they're putting an action shot in there and you can't, it's in the dark and you can't freaking see anything that's happening. And they may have like the coolest song playing, but you're like, I can't even fucking see what's happening. So who is somebody winning or somebody dying or I have no clue. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, wasn't, wasn't that a great scene? No, it wasn't a great scene. Even though the song was awesome. Yeah, different show, but Ryan and I were saying how the cinematography in this movie is it's beautiful. Like it's, it's it this movie is vibes. Like I think it 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 subsists on vibes kind of, and so the music is a big part of that. Cinematography is a big part of that. Like it it's really great to watch. You're in this like beautiful kind of lush world that is also oppressive and awful, and everyone's terrible. So it's a really interesting experiment. <laughs> Yeah, and, in creating like the weirdest vibes. And and the soundtrack and the score, I feel like, are almost like fighting each other. Yeah, they are. So, totally. so you have an Anthony Willis score. You also scored a promising young woman who is, which was, which was Emerald Fennell's last film. So they work together. So you have this kind of intense drama score going throughout, and then you have like Girls Aloud. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you know that I think that was like capturing that because it was like this to- the moments where the songs came in that you're like, yeah, this is a song i can murder to or slurp juice to or you know whatever the like whatever that is like she she has this way of of picking the right moment to transition the scene using the right context of the song that you needed so it there's not very many directors that that get that like there's people that will will work with um artists in particular to do a score that makes complete sense and they go like this could not have been done by anybody else when you listen to that watch that movie and you go okay this movie had to be played with this artist it just matches to it but for her to to have that you know have that the orchestration to it and then the songs that she puts in it that tells the whole story it it's true it's sometimes it seems like they're combating but i still think it works 
Yeah, it works because there's this juxtaposition too, right? Of like you're in this state um, that represents sort of an old world. And then you get these reminders that you're with these, you know, young kids essentially in, you know, this very 2007 new world and these clashes of, you know, who people are and classes and things like that. Or it, it does work, I think, in the, on that level. It's also just, I don't know, to me, like super entertaining to hear Mr. Brightside. <laughs> Like to hear people singing along to Mr. Brightside, which is apparently huge in the UK. It's oh yeah, like a really popular song there, right? Like it could be like their new national anthem if they needed. I to keep hearing it. that that in, in the UK, Mr. Brightside is like it's it's it. Like people can play it at like football games. Like people are like oh, big into that Mr. Brightside. Awesome. There. It's very anthemic for for the Brits. I can't ask a Brit right now to be and they'd probably be like, uh, not everybody likes Mr. Brightside. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that that whole first read. killers album I feel like is just full of bangers. It's yeah, that's another one. Like I didn't look through every single one of the albums that come from every single one of the tracks, but I can tell you one hundred percent that the Arcade Fire song, that album is completely solid too. So I have a feeling I don't have to listen to them. I'm just gonna assume that she picked not only the single or the song that goes from that album. But I have a feeling she picked also like how she has this magical ability to then also pick that every single song on that other, on the album that that song comes from is also awesome. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying right now. It's that that's hundred percent it. I don't have to listen to the other albums, but now I'm going to go do that to prove myself. Right. But that's how I feel. I, I find the cold war kids to be pretty mid. <sighs> I love the Cold War kids. I was reminded of them. And I'm like, oh, hold me up to yeah. dry. That's aggressively too. But that is like their best song, like easily their yeah. best song. I don't know. I think I think they have some. I have some expensive. other depth that I like. They get they get a little depressing at times, but that's you know mm-hmm. they're called the Cold War kids. What do you expect? But I think it's fair to say that there may be some selections on here that they've got a little whiff of the fromage. Like they could be considered a little cheesy or a little obvious. So which one would you say is the most Depending on where you're coming from in that conversation. I think Cold War Kids in contention for sure. I think that MGMT song, because it's just so, it's been so overplayed, especially if you grew up, like if you came of age at like a specific time, I think it's been very overplayed. That one struck me the most because it's, you know, it's a needle drop, like, in that moment. They're, like, naked in a field and then doing, like, fun party things, party college kid things. And MGMT's playing, and I'm like, okay. They kind of erectile dysfunction. (laughs) (laughs) No one's getting erectile dysfunctions uh, walking around nude in the grass, in the tall grass. Right. No, no, no. There was, there was not really a lot of. There's a lot of dysfunction. It's just not erectile in this movie. <laughs> I don't know what you're. T- Everyone's erections working fine. I don't know fine, what you're talking but about. But nothing dis- dysfunction at all. There was so much function in this movie. Like mad function. No, but I, it was kind of nice. I don't know about how it felt for for you two, but it is nice to hear bands like Lady Tron for me. Like, oh, that's Lady Tron playing in the bar. That's rad. I like being reminded of them. I like being remembered of that time that I bought the Block Party CD. Yeah. No, I and the one that actually got me too is that as I pulled the album up and then I as I was going through the the movie again, I'm like there's songs that didn't show up on the album that were still in the movie. Mhm. Yeah, and that happens Which a lot. Which disappointed me cuz I'm like, See? man, they should have had all those on there. Like what how did they not rate? Probably right. too expensive. Yeah, it's probably too expensive. It's like a licensing thing. But that's um it's kind of nice to live in an era where Spotify exists and then you have the obsessives and fans putting together like the definitive playlist of all the songs that you hear in a particular movie. I'm always really proud of those people. Like, thank you, human. Thank you, thank you for your service. I assume in two thousand twenty three Mr. Brightside is very expensive to license. <laughs> Yeah, that was um if if what I read about it was correct, that is the the most expensive one and they wouldn't say what they paid for it, but it was it was a penny or two. Yeah, that you know, when you hear that much content in a movie to to know that that there's so much cost cuz I watch a lot of independent film and lots of times when I talk with the directors, they're like, "Yeah, we just couldn't afford to put anything in there. That's why you got some crappy <laughs> off the shelf crap that fits in there which again i'm like you know 
just spend a little bit more money and find a friend who's a musician and get them to write it for you. Like mm -hmm. they probably would love that gig. Right. Absolutely. Or have them do a yeah. cover. You know, covers are a lot cheaper than paying for the originals. Yeah. Do a Goodwill hunting thing, you know, or you're just working with somebody that's you're working with an Elliot Smith before they break it. Like, really Yeah, just big. find the next Elliot know. Smith. That should be that it's hard. It's easy. It, they're everywhere. Throw a rock, you'll hit one. <laughs> Yeah, like go find your just go find your Simon and Garfunkel and graduate it up. Yeah, what are you guys even yeah, doing? Like... No, but but you're right though, and you mentioned it earlier, Jim, that like sound and music can really make or break a film, and I think it's fair to say that funding can make or break a film. Yeah, and this one had funding, like so expensive yeah. to look well, at, and and here it's like. Oh, do you rich. think? Do you think that was because? Promising Young Woman won an Oscar? I would go out on a limb and say yes. I, I, I also understand that um, that Emerald Fennel is herself like fairly upper crust mm -hmm. to begin with. And I don't know a lot about the UK class system. So like, I don't know how stuff works and like what happens when you go to Eton College and all this stuff, right? I'm not gonna claim like knowledge of that, but I think she, she comes from a fairly wealthy background. But you, I, I mean, having a name like Emerald Fennel makes you sound like you have a wealthy background. Yeah. I mean, it does Venetia in the film. Like, this all felt, I think, probably pretty close to some of the things that maybe she's experienced in her life and in her class circles. It's got to be drawn from something. The kid, not to get off on a tangent about the characters, but the character dialogue that's the, the funny part in the movie to me is like the interactions between the family members. And some of the conversations they have and how absolutely and utterly bullcrap and fake they are. But they're just like, it's like barbs that are wrapped in like niceness, right? That felt very real. Like there's no way that you can write that without having been in that room Oh, before. for sure. Right? Like that, right? That, that's that's part of what I, like the, to your point, the humor in it was actually what makes it so endearing to me is that to have such a, a film that just has mm -hmm. this character, the, probably some of the deepest character development of any film that's ever been written in the history of film and then have Come some down. of the dialogue that's just like it 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 brought that humor to it to know that okay like Barry is like one of the creepiest people that's ever walked the face of the earth <laughs> and the fact that as his character progresses he comes from this like it, it wasn't like when we talked earlier it wasn't a surprise to me at all. Like I knew exactly what had happened through the entire movie. The first time I watched it, it wasn't like, oh, yeah. it wasn't like the, I see dead people. It, there wasn't, there wasn't <laughs> like any of that for, it was just like, okay, you know, this is coming. I just want to, and because it, I liked the way that it, it unfolded. It didn't annoy me because really obvious twists that they try and do like that normally annoy the fuck out of me. And I'm like, this movie's now terrible because this reveal was just awful. But when they do it as clever as they did, like for, to reveal it as he's, you know, on top of, on top of her. And then he, next scene, he's dancing naked through her house. Like you, you just can't go, but okay, that was brilliant. Like how are, how are you going to end this movie? The only way that's possible is to have him run around the house naked. Cause it's now his place. Do you feel like Gemma says like, it's brilliant and how bonkers it is and how kind of like maximalist yes, it is that's why it's so good like things that are over the top if it's done right like his character is just it's so deep and his character has this arc that you don't see coming and then when it's slowly revealed through the entire movie like there's not very many characters that have that much change and development throughout the entire film and at the whole time at each level of his development he's creepy but in different ways, right? And then by the time you get to the end and you're just like, could this guy get any creepier? And then they just she just ones up one ups it one more time to be that when he at the very end when he's dancing naked, you're like, Yeah, like if this would have ended any other way, I would have been disappointed. But thank God that you ended it like this. Cause it really showed who he was, that he was such a mastermind. Like going back and seeing that, you know, he you know that. But by the time you got to the part where he gets to the to to the castle, for lack of a better word, you know that he he punctured his tire. You know, you knew that. Right. Like you knew he had he had planned right. everything. Even when you looked the very first scene when he gets to 
um, but it's, it's Oxford, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when he gets to Oxford and he's looking out the window at him, you're like, okay, there's my target. I'm ready to go. Right. Like it was like, you could feel it. And when you watch it a second time, even it's like, okay, it's so obvious, more obvious. Right. Yeah, this character's... Yeah, Barry Kay has a very sinister energy, I think, in general. He's kind of a... He's a little bit impish. He's not trustworthy, which is... Like, not at any point. So, yeah, you don't you don't trust him at any point in this film. So it is not at all, like, surprising. I wouldn't even really call it a twist ending. Yeah, I mean, the second you see, he's watching Felix having sex with that girl, he's just smoking a cigarette, just staring in at his window. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> the one... <laughs> Who did it? I can't imagine how this might have happened. Yeah. Everyone dead. Yeah, well, that, and that, you know, the the point for me that it was, was when he had Felix's girlfriend and she wanted to have sex with him. And, like, any young guy, you would think, okay, he's going to get laid here. And then, so he does, he completely says something that it's like, blows it up. And it's just like, yeah. That's him, because he's 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 manipulating everybody all the time. It's just it's every every scene I just loved, love this movie. I don't know why you didn't love it so much. I don't like what what was it about it that caused you not to have the same? I I don't know why I didn't love it more because it has everything I love. It has full frontal nudity. It has Jacob Elordi being tall. Mm -hmm. It has the worst and best parts of the aughts. You know, so it's just, like everything is here for me. I think I just didn't like any of these people to the, but I, but like no one in the film was likable. So it's a hard, it's a, it, I think I'm going to have to think about it a little bit. It's a hardly helped film to live in, you know, like you're not like, I want to stay here. This is nice. Like everyone sucks. And it's like, can you just murk these people already? Yeah, it's a, it's a very, I, it's Ryan a very that. uncomfortable experience. It's uncomfortable. And I think Ryan, you'd mentioned this, that, one of um, her inspirations for this film was the film Cruel Intentions. And I think a lot of that shows through as well. I think it's got a very B-movie kind of quality to it, but with a big budget. Because Cruel Intentions is very camp. Mm. Yeah, it's very soapy, very campy. And I think I just don't typically get on board with movies like that. Yeah. It felt like a telenovela to me. Like I knew everything that was going to happen for the most part. And all of these twists were like, whoa, is this like, is this happening? It's just very like all operatic and over the top is like you said, Jim. And there are parts of that that I appreciated. Like, well, yeah, we're really doing it. We're going here. We're doing these scenes. But I, I yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I would want to watch it again. So it goes in that pile of movies where I'm like, well, that was a good experiment. I don't know that I will watch it. Don't know it again. if I would do this again. Yeah. So for me, like I'm I'm the biggest driver. I know we talked about how I think certain things are important to have to be within a film. But for me, character is everything in a film. Like if if I watch an action film and the characters are developed well, I will like it. If the action is like just all action, well, sometimes I'll like it that too, but if if a character is super developed, then to me, that wins out over story, wins out over plot, it, like it wins out over everything. Because in that case, I I fell in love with Barry's character of Ollie, and I just couldn't get over how well formed and deformed his character was. That so. I, I was rooting for him the whole time. Like, I was like, yeah, he's going to take us places that we're not. And I was just so happy to be along for the ride. Yeah, this is the sort of movie where my wife watches it on her own because she's just like, Ryan's not going to want to watch this movie unless he has to do a podcast about it. Because <laughs> I was like, have you seen Saltburn? Like, I'm, I have to do it for this podcast. And I, you know, I'm, I've, I've started watching it. And she goes, Oh yeah, and I was like, "Wait, you seen Saltburn?" And she goes, "Oh yeah, I saw Saltburn." She's keeping it from you. <laughs> How could you not talk to someone about this movie? And I was like, it, I, "I was like, it's it's, it's pretty, it's pretty disturbing." And she's like, "Oh, are you talking about the bathtub scene?" I was like, "Yes." <laughs> It's funny how the bathtub scene Shout gets such a it. bad rap. When I think him fucking the grave is like way more 
It's the slurping. The the gray fucking didn't bother yeah, but me he's, as much. The gray fucking. He stuck like, his yeah, okay. he stuck his hard wiener well, at that in point, dirt. At, like at that got, point, you're not he got, surprised. He got dirt. At in that point, it's pee. not shocking. He got it's dirt like, of course in his he's going pee to. hole. Like that's just gotta not I be cool. Just, Nick, Nicole doesn't it's know what it what brand. it's like to have dirt in your pee hole. So, well, yeah, but. She knows. I mean, she has a pee hole. So imagine yeah, getting dirty imagine in your pee hole, on the Good. <laughs> um, honestly, that was the furthest thing from my mind. Like, oh, poor Barry, he's got dirt in his pee hole. Don't do that. I'm sure. Like that wasn't. I really was like, how thing. method are you, Barry? Yeah, exactly. That's what, that's what I was. The whole time I was going like, oh, you know what? This is this is a really cool scene. But I'm like, the whole time I'm crossing my legs, going, I don't want that dirt in my pee hole. I had read that he improved that. I don't know how much of that is true and how much of this was scripted, but the word on the street is that he just went for it and no one told him to. I've, I've, so I've that, also read that. If there's dirt in his pee hole still, that was by nice. choice. Well, he is pretty method. Commitment. Like, hey, Emerald, let me try something here. Just, just let it roll. She's just like, keep going. Like, imagine that set. Yeah, totally. Insane. And Jacob Lordy just walking around being like seven foot five, standing in front of like sunlit windows. <laughs> Barry Keegan's creeping in the back, thinking about like how he's got to go to the doctor <laughs> and for what he has to go to the doctor for that yeah, there's day. Got some, there's got to be some production assistant that's that's suing the production company for to- for hostile work environment. <laughs> Like, right it's like how do you even have an intimacy coordinator on that set for example like what are they gonna like coordinate with the dirt yep. plot i don't what do you even do at that point like an insane it's some insane things happen in this film and so for that i applaud it but i was not offended by the grave fucking i was only offended by the slurping because <laughs> i have a thing with people like, it's, a, it's a slurping in general like slurping their soup. Uh, well, the same there you thing. go like you can't you just don't like the sound of slurp i i, no. I get it no, don't go to a ramen right. restaurant. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah, totally. Polite, like, right? I guess he was trying to be polite. Yeah, that's my favorite thing in in Korean movies is when they, because they almost every single Korean movie that's ever been made, and I watch I watch a ton of them, is they always have to have ramen in, in the movie. Like, they always stop somewhere and have ramen. It's just like, it's kind of like their national, this is a rule. It doesn't matter, like, right? They gotta have some sort of stew, right? Yeah, it's it's a hundred percent. It's like when John Claude Van Damme used to make movies. It's like it's written into my contract. I gotta do the splits because no one does it like me, <laughs> right? Or when no one, no one does. Early though. Mark Wahlberg's like, I gotta take my shirt off in every movie. It's like it's a rule. Or in France, I think up until I saw my first French film from France the other day that didn't have nudity in it. I was like, what is this? I'm confused. Whoa. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right? the government let that happen? Yeah, I, I know. That's I was so surprised. Tragic. Threw me for a loop. Really too bad. Standards I know, right? are lowering. You know what we expect from Emerald next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know why this is not a good segue from what we were just talking about, but can we talk about the karaoke scene? Yeah. Why? What? Let's talk about the karaoke you, scene. It's not as iconic <laughs> as the cable guy karaoke scene. Yeah, I know. Like it, where does it rate? I guess in like the pantheon of karaoke scenes in films, I felt like it had a way bigger piece of prominence and a way bigger moment that I wasn't expecting. I'm like, oh, we're doing karaoke in the estate now. Like it was very jarring. For I think me. that for me it was unreal <laughs> to hear Flo Rida. It was unrealistic for me to think that that TV would be that small and that size of a mansion, even in 2007. Right? I was kind of like, why right? do they not have? Because didn't they have those, like in 2007, they had those ones that had the big screen with the lights that. I, they absolutely did. They were two TVs maybe still, but they, you could get a no, big you, TV. They like, had I HD TVs in 2006. Movie. Yeah. You did had they? flat screens. I, it felt weird. A lot of things about it felt really weird. Yeah. The flow rider was weird. Sorry. Yeah, the the song choice was it good. It shows they have no taste. Yeah. <laughs> it's just another pope. I guess that's what it's projecting, right? Maybe no taste whatsoever. Um and then you get you get the Pet Shop Boys Rent, which is probably the worst song. What the oldest the oldest song too that they pull for this movie just for the sake of like as you pointed out, like they're still lyrical on the noseness mm-hmm. that they needed to put in there so that you could, you know, be embarrassed by 
you know, you don't pay us rent to live here, essentially. Yep. Like that, that, whatever the lyric but is. That, that, yeah, did, did it, but did it bother you though? Like for, in particular, the Pet Shop Boy song? No, not at all. I mean, no, I don't think it bothered me at all. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, good pull. Just tracking with what's happening right now. Um, I did like how he called up the American character to finish the song because he's essentially like in the same position of not belonging there, really. Yep. Um, I was like, Ooh. I love how he burned him in that. How he got him punted from it. It's like, yeah. like nobody thought to think, well, where are you the entire night? But he points out that he's he's doing coke, and really yeah, nice. he's yeah. doing coke when when he when Felix dies. And so it's like he's all of a sudden a bad person, right? And that scene, first of all, like you mentioned character development, but the casting in this movie is like it's a chef's kiss of casting. It's, it's really so good. I think it's so good in that scene after Felix dies and everyone's coping, not coping around the giant dining table and they're trying to get the curtains closed so that they don't see the corner and the curtains closed and everything goes red. Everything's just washed in red. Because this movie is not nope. subtle, right? It's just it's washed in red and no one's dealing. And then he calls out Farley for like doing lines and he gets like whisked away, like shaking and crying. That was the, honestly, that's probably the most fucked up part of the movie for me. <laughs> it's a fucked yeah, up scene. I, I would, I would agree that um, it, it mostly because of the way they're communicating, right? It's kind of like, yes. but, but that kind of, kind of showed their whole relationship like these two parents are so clued out to everything they live in this complete different universe than everybody else lives in and yet the kids kind of live in it too and they accept it it's just like the friend of of the mother that's there and you're kind of mm -hmm. like everybody's just like okay she's still here and and it's just like they they don't want confrontation either right it's like they they can't take certain things and how they have certain rules like you got to wear a, a tuxedo to dinner and just some of the the whole idioms of the family that just you get involved in it and you're just like this is so weird but it you could imagine that this is what quirky rich people do yeah well especially people that are not just quirky rich but like you know old money english estate like connected to the royal family kind of fucked up mm -hmm. rich where the net like tragedy has really never touched mm -hmm. them like nothing touches them they are completely insular it made me think too of that you know that like creepy painting that got released of um king charles this yeah. week did you guys see the creepy painting the creepy painting that's like it's literally like it's like somebody ripped up somebody's chest cavity, splattered it on a canvas, and then painted King Charles into it. It's just like completely red, like that scene in the movie. It is messed up and great. It's so great. I want to get a t-shirt of that. Can, do th oh my God, it's art. It's so good. Do you good. think I can get that t-shirt It's so somewhere? Good. Oh, I'm sure there's a thousand so. t-shirts of it already. Yeah. Somebody's like selling it like outside like the Tower Bridge right now. Like, oi! <laughs> Get your King Charles shirts. So it was really well, bad. Well, how we're like part of the UK empire. I have a feeling I can probably go outside my house right now and there's probably somebody on the street selling it. So maybe I'll... Oh, true. When we're done, I yeah. think I'm just going to go outside and say, hey, who's got that shirt? <laughs> it's between the weed shop and the That's liquor right. store, right? It's somebody. It's like... <laughs> 100%. Yeah, I mean, the family itself, the dynamics is almost like... A horror movie and then 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 uh, ollie himself is also like another horror movie and they they just meet each other and uh everything goes to shit yeah so was, so w ryan was this the like for this episode was this the first time you got to see this film for both of you yes yes so you okay so but you'd heard the soundtrack before obviously I knew them I, part of it, yeah. but I wasn't deeply invested in it. I don't know if you were, if you knew more about it than no, I did. No, I only really knew the murder on the dance floor. And I was like, this song? This song is back? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I wasn't too familiar with it the first time, but I was like, isn't this a really old song? 2007. <laughs> so I, I, I yeah, I, I didn't know that. I only knew really that, and then I knew about the slurping. <laughs> so were you guys a... 
I knew about the bathtub scene going in and I knew about the grave scene going in yeah. because it's really hard to not watch a movie for that long and also be like just so deeply in fucked up parts of the internet and like cinema culture that you're not going to have certain things spoiled for you. So certain things were spoiled for me, um, but they also like didn't prepare me adequately for watching them because <laughs> I hadn't watched the scenes like that at least like I didn't. I don't Had you, Ryan, you seen any like clips from this film? Because it's been on Prime for, like, mm -hmm. a long time. I feel like it's been streaming on Prime for a hot minute. No. Like I said, I didn't I didn't even know that my wife had watched it. <laughs> well, that's because you and your wife don't talk. That's why. But clearly you're not communicating, right? Because how could you, how does she keep this to herself? I would have been, she like, was over there, like, She very nonchalant about it. She was like, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, you know, that the, the big uh, finale, Murder on the Dance Floor, and Barry, Barry Keegan ran around, and she's like, Oh yeah, I do remember that now. I thought I was she like, what now? Now she remembers. She's like, oh, I kind of had it on in the background. I was like, this is not a movie that what? that that you can have on in the background. Like, if you have salt, no. if you have salt burn on, like, it it is too enticing to not watch and not pay what? attention. Like, it's too pretty looking. The music is too magnetic for you to be like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna put it on while I'm doing some work. So I'm I'm just curious though, like, was it something that you made conscious decisions? No, I'm not going to watch it, or because it because it, especially with it because of the buzz of the soundtrack. Like to your point, Nicole, about it being, you know, the Kate Bush of of la of 2023, right? Like, what what caused you not to see it? Like, was was something that you'd heard about it, or you just for me, I'm occasionally the person that comes to things a little too late because reasons and because life. And then sometimes I feel like, well, I'm too late. I'm too late to the party. Like the salt burn party is over now. Like people aren't, well, who am I gonna? I, so there, I think part of me felt like, okay, well, I've moved on to other things. I'll see it eventually. Thankfully, it is streaming on, on Prime and I am the number one Amazon Prime customer. So it was easy to watch. It's not like... I had to work for it, like some of the films that we talk about on this podcast. I, Ryan, were you just kind of like avoiding it actively? Like, this is not for me, I don't think. No, I wasn't really avoiding it. Uh, I, I probably even suggested watching it at one point, like when my wife and I had time to like stream a movie. And maybe she was like, I already, I already saw it. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I, I, I think I was interested in it. It was kind of, it was on the radar, I think. But, you know, with having two kids, like, got to pick and choose. and Not two, films. yeah. It's, 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 it's like, you the cut this. Like, I, like I'm like amazed this, like, that I was able to see poor things. Right, because it's like, that's not, you can't let anybody, yeah, want to catch you. Yeah, <laughs> you I can't, can't have, have my five-year-old not... waking up and being like, Mommy, Daddy, I can't sleep. What's this movie? <laughs> <laughs> right? That's a, the and, one anyway. you stream in your bedroom with the lock on. The kid has to knock. Right. You know, mm -hmm. when you have sexy time, Ryan, you got to have a lock on the door when you have young kids because they're coming in at all times nonstop. I pooped myself. I'm going to throw up. I'm tired. I had a. I threw yeah. up. This was nominated for a lot of Oscars. <laughs> As you turn off the TV, close the laptop. I, I thought I thought I wouldn't see anything more bonkers than poor things and salt burn is not as bonkers. It's yeah. just weird in different other ways. It's weird in a different way is what I would yeah. say. But, but yeah, it's not to keep going back to 2007, but did, did this make you feel like you were in 2007 or because I don't know what 2007 was like in the UK, but I kept wondering why like Jacob Elordi didn't have, I don't know, Tobey Maguire's haircut from Spider-Man, <laughs> like why he wasn't looking more emo or something. Did anyone else have that impression of like, why is, why is there not more Abercrombie not, and Fitch? Not everybody he was, was kind of Abercrombie. Like yeah, a there was bit. a little Abercrombie going on. A little bit. A little bit. Maybe they were too rich for that. I, I don't think know. So. I think there's yeah. like a different, They have their own haircuts. There's a different The rich person. people have their own haircuts. Like, yeah. They do. So that's what yeah. we saw. We saw the rich haircuts. That's, that's the, that's what we saw. 
but we're just we couldn't possibly understand the upper crust haircuts from 2007 yeah. but it was funny to me because they they gave jacob alordi felix that uh that eyebrow piercing and that you see it and then i think he mentions it very pointedly like i can't wear my eyebrow piercing to salt bird nobody likes that like as if to say we're in 2007 <laughs> now uh -huh. hardware and my eyebrow but this is the only part where i'm like okay okay we're in a period film. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that, I, I think when I was even watching it, because usually when I watch, we go to the cinema, I, I usually try not to see the trailer. The only time I see a trailer is if I've, I'm in the cinema watching a movie and then the trailer comes on and then I end up watching that movie later on. So yeah, for me, it was like, I knew it was a period piece just because of the music that was playing. Like that's what, that's what gives it away is the music, not so much because- yeah majority of it is in like a college or university that it's it's kind of just you don't know it's it's a period piece from there and then when you go to the castle it's like you wouldn't know anyway because it's a freaking castle that's probably 500 years old so yeah. it it's just the music that kind of gives it away which kind of makes it kind of has that nostalgia piece to it but for me it was just i think Again, I keep, I just keep reiterating it that the film is told through the music, and that to me is just makes the album a, a solid album to listen to. I'm always sad though that they don't put the album together with the soundtrack side of it, right? Like, you know, like my biggest complaint in the history of soundtracks is the Hunger soundtrack, because again, couldn't didn't have all the songs on it. And it's one of my favorite soundtracks right. to this day. Right. Right. I mean, that kind of stuff is frustrating. And, and I and I think I think you're right. And that's what I was trying to get to is that in this film, the music is doing like 90 percent of the work to tell you where you are and who, what people's motivations are sort of like there's there's it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting in a way that I think most soundtracking doesn't have to. And I think that was she, she must have known that. Right. Like going in like, no. We're going to need like Pitchfork's top 50 indie songs of 2007. We have to have them or people won't know where we are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, In time. And you, and you can tell she's very, 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 very involved with the soundtrack of this movie. Yeah. And I, I think I had also read that these are these are mostly like her selects and we don't know what got left on the cutting mm. room floor and that they couldn't negotiate. But it, it's mostly her kind of hand picking, which, you know, a lot of filmmakers do. But it feels pretty hand selected. Yeah, it makes me want to go back now and watch Promising Young Women again, so I can see if it had the same like I I don't even pulled up I haven't even pulled up the soundtrack for that, so I I, I didn't have the same impact on me as this one did. So mm, I don't even remember if Promising Young Women was a period piece too. Like I can't even remember it when you think think of it, right? I are there any songs from the aughts, since we're calling it that, I think, that you or artists that you feel like might have made it on here? Like, who do you think, who else would have been on this? Hot Chip. Because I was thinking to myself, like, Hot Chip, but Hot Chip could have been on here. Like, why aren't the Arctic Monkeys here? That yeah. Because right it's too British. Because they too, It's too British. they're too big no. now. Yeah. Well, and also they have Maybe those thick no. British accents in their singing. Hmm. And it's that also she wanted to want to pick that uh that song about being on the dance floor and she's already got that. Yeah. She's got that on lock. <laughs> Put on your true. dancing <laughs> shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love How about that. some Franz Ferdinand? <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah, there's an real like kind of garage bandy stuff, but I think that just wouldn't have made sense. And I think I think maybe the idea is that these they're not this is not, they're not like listening to underground music necessarily. You're not listening to like a deep cut. No. Well, I mean, right. Uh, maybe, not that France maybe, underground maybe, is maybe to be able to afford Mr. Brightside, they're like, for our garage selection, we're going to have to go with Cold War Kids instead of Franz Ferdinand. <laughs> but maybe I'm always like tantalized by the idea of like, who could they not get? What did they, what was there like a first option maybe that they didn't get and they had to go with the backups? Just like with casting, like it was wonder, you know? Yeah, I mean, but I, I don't but... think, 
I don't know. I don't know Billboard's top 100. I don't follow Billboard, right? From 2007? No, you don't know, I don't Jim, off the top of my head. Like, but even now, I don't know what's on the Billboard top 100. Yeah, well, nobody It's does. all Kendrick nobody Lamar knows. dissing Drake. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like 27 rap beef yeah. songs. Oh, That's my God. Don't, literally what don't it get is. me started on that. I don't One, three, it. and six are dissing Drake. Seven is Drake dissing Kendrick. <laughs> <laughs> and then the rest from 10 to 20 is just Taylor yeah, Swift. Yeah, you're right. It's Tay Tay. Yeah, Post, Ma- Post Malone and Taylor Swift. <laughs> Hannah Montana is on there somewhere. Hannah Montana. Speaking in, speaking I love oh, Miley, Miley. Miley. Yeah, speaking of nudity. Miley nudists. Cyrus. She's in there. Speaking of nudists. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about she was in the, the soundtrack, and I was like, no, she would probably fit better being in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, that too, because she does like to be nude. So, you know. I, actually, of all of all pop artists, I think Miley Cyrus is probably my favorite of all of them. She can yeah. sing, and she's kind of fucked up like her. in her personal life, which yeah. makes her cool. She hangs out with my favorite band, The Flaming Lips. So, yeah, so she can't no, be all bad. She's covering right? Psycho Killer for the Stop Making Sense tribute album. Yeah, I know, right. Anyway, it's hard for me to remember 2007 because now I, I realize that was a really long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Upsetting truth. I'm turning to dust as we speak. Re- like, literally, this movie turned me to ashes. It reduced me. It was difficult. I was like, oh, no, we are we are there. It um, it turned me more to bath water to me. <laughs> period of film do you have a favorite musical moment on this soundtrack Jim? um besides murder yeah i mean i feel like we all that that's a not say it, that's you know. a given you know actually the one for me I, like I, I because i'm such a huge Ar- arcade fires fan when i heard that they were playing it i'm always surprised when i hear like artists especially canadian artists that just show up in surprising places and and so, yeah, when I heard the Arcade Fire on there, I was just like, and then some of them too, like you're, you're, I'm listening, like you can't even hear who that is. So I had to crank, crank it up. Right. Like there was the one track in the bar and I'm like, who is that? But thank God for Prime, you hit pause and you get to know what the song is. They tell yeah, you. I know. Yeah. It's like, it's Great like the feature. best feature. I don't think even Apple does that. Yeah. Especially for this podcast. Yeah, exactly, right? Right. Sponsor us well, yeah. time. Other, otherwise, you're you're like pulling up Shazam and you're going like, hey, turning it up right now. What is this? I'm holding my Apple Watch to the speakers going, what song is this? <laughs> but yeah, that was for me. For me, that was that was that was it because I was just like. As because it just came off the bike and because I'm a little bit of an anti car and then they come off the bike scene right into no cars go. And I'm just like, you're brilliant. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. It's it's just like, you're brilliant. What about, I wonder if she good. called Arcade Fire. Can you record a new version of it called No Bikes Go? <laughs> Please? <laughs> no, that's the spin though, Ryan, is that no cars go because they were riding bikes <laughs> on the bike path. Yeah, but his bike also broke. Yeah, yeah. well, but the other one didn't. That's true. And Ollie was like, I'll take your bike back to the college. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and that scene happens obviously very early in the film. And I think you hear like three different, like fairly sticky and memorable Ots songs that are playing, you know, in the bar. And that, that kind of puts you there, right? Like, okay, I'm hearing like block parties and that, Lady Tron's and that. And you're like, okay, yeah, okay. I get where we are now. I understand. It's college, it's 2007. Yeah, I'm surprised by the actual British pop music that's in this movie, like the girls allowed and stuff. I was like, oh, like that's, that's you know, it's it's not stuff that I ever really discovered back in 2007. So to hear it side by side with some of these like indie songs was kind of a trip for me. Like listening to the soundtrack in the car, I was like, what the hell is this? Yeah, and I think like over there on the island, right? Like maybe there's just a different connection to that sort of pop music. I felt like I feel like there's a they were probably a much bigger deal than we understand. Girls Aloud specifically. Yeah, I, like I think they were a pretty yeah, big maybe, deal in that era. Right? Like that's just it. 
maybe inescapably. So, do you guys listen to college radio though, in general? Not these days. I still try to every now and then because that's how you kind of find cool stuff. Because if if you're listening to actual regular radio, you never hear any cool stuff. You never hear any really cool indie stuff. So it's only when you're I don't know if you use Apple or Spotify, but for Apple, it's like, I love it. And I'm sure Spotify does the same thing where you'd be like, I want to listen to this album for the soundtrack and then create a, um, a playlist off of the song on it and mm -hmm. just have it play through a whole thing. Yeah. So, cause you'll get introduced to stuff. And you're like, wow, I didn't know. I never even heard this song back in 2007. Right. Right. I used to do that with Spotify, and then you used to be like, hey, have you heard of this band called Pavement? I'm like, yeah, I know Pavement. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows bit. Pavement. <laughs> I was thinking about you the other day, Ryan, because I, I started listening to Primus again. And, oh. and I was like, you know, this would be something that Ryan and I could both jam to for sure. You know, it, it, it's funny, me and, me and Nicole have a uh, mutual friend who – like assumed I was going to go to the, the Primus concert a, a couple months ago. Just like she's, he saw Nicole and was like, Ryan's going to Primus, really right? Fair. And she's like, I don't think so. And, and he never asked me directly, but just assumed for many months I was going to the Primus show. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not going, man. And he, he's like, why not? And I was like, because I don't want to see the other bands. <laughs> and he was like, I know, but I want to yell like Primus sucks at Primus and it'd be funny. And I was like, well, that would be funny, but not for like the amount of money I would have to pay for that. So it was like Pussifer and Primus. And Perfect Circle, and I think. Else. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. He was, we can cut all of this, but yeah, Leonard has like weird motivations. So, sorry, he and wanted then... to go to Primus <laughs> so he could say Primus sucks to Primus? Yeah, like it's a joke. Is that. I... That doesn't sound funny. No. Like that's just like, if I was at that concert, I'd punch him in the face and say, "No, they don't." No, I, like it feels like a dangerous concert to do I, that. I, think, kind of. I, I don't, I, I don't remember that. the exact reference, but it is a it's it is a reference that Primus fans would understand. Uh, is it about? I, I forget exactly what it is, but but I, I heard Les Claypool was very entertaining. All three bands were on stage at the same time, and. He had like yeah. a, a like a wheelchair lift to bring him like up to where like the drum riser was, and he every time he would go, he would like go up the scale, nice. <laughs> like as he's going up, elevated, he would nice. start going up on the. But anyways, I, I I didn't care for seeing the other two bands, and um, you know if Primus is not headlining and if they're splitting equal time, I'm not gonna pay like a hundred yeah. plus dollars. But two people were thinking almost at the same time that uh -huh. that you should be more of a Primus fan, maybe. Maybe, maybe it, it honestly, maybe the universe is trying to tell you something. <laughs> maybe you should heed the call. Yes, I think I will. Throw the stop making sense in the trash. We're gonna listen to Primus tomorrow. <laughs> I'm, that's all I'm listening to. Why is it Primus on the Salt Burn soundtrack? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> When, yeah, they could have had it when um, when he was finger banging. What's her face? When well, she was on her period. <laughs> when and, Brown, and Big Brown Beaver. Is Big Brown Beaver. That would have been. That should have been the. Song. <laughs> I think we should send a, we should send her a note to say you know there was one thing that was missing. Although I don't think that song came out in two thousand and six. No, that was like ninety something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my god! But it, it existed in the it's world. True, like, it's true. It's true. It's it's okay if it's older than two thousand seven. Yeah, it's, it's not true. okay. Yeah, if it's that's newer. Just, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how bad she probably wanted to use paper planes, but I don't think paper planes came out until like oh eight or oh mm nine. -hmm. I also thought that when I was watching it, I'm like, I know she. Uh, use some MIA would have been maybe some sleigh bells. Paper oh, she, right. See, but too late. It's a different. Yeah, we'll I'll never know why she didn't pick um, some of the bands that we've listed today. But you know what? Maybe she will in her next movie. Salt Someone burn. knows Big Brown Salt Beavers burn. right there. That's right. She's doing a 1990s <laughs> period piece. Imagine if you're right. Yeah. Like, what if that, do if that does happen? 
we're yeah. doing this again. Oh, yeah, for whatever so, movie that Parker. is. Well, we, we yeah, might all now have obviously. to go back. Well, I'll go back and watch it, but you two will have to watch Promising Young Women and see if you're as offended or, or as... Ryan has seen it. You've seen no. it, right? It's I said I just read, no, read up on it, it and I was like, okay, these two movies sound very much like a singular vision of this one person. Well, and what's really funny about Promising Young Woman, I think it's similarly maybe divisive, is that I have... Um, I have a camp of people in my life that are like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. And then I have a camp of people in my life that are like, this is the best movie I've ever seen. I would say so, it was the best movie. Maybe that should make me want to watch it more. I wouldn't say it's the best movie, but I really loved it. So um, my partner Bryce on our podcast, he didn't love it as much as me. He didn't like the ending. Like with Bryce, if the ending is not what he wanted it or expected, then he doesn't, he doesn't love it. But to me, it was the perfect ending for that movie so i'm anxious to know what you guys think about it when you finally do see it to say like the ending yes or no right so so the salt burn ending is it the ending that bryce was expecting or he just enjoyed the ending uh oh in, in salt burn um we, we both knew what was happening as we watched it like it, it we knew there was no big reveal for us because after the film we had talked about it like all the way home in the car. But it was just because the ending of what it was was so satisfying, right? It was like for both of us, it was kind of like, yeah, how could you have ended this movie other than that, right? Like if, if, if you did something, because you go from something completely obvious, but then you make it fucked up, it just keeps that whole tone of the film of being over the top wackadoodle, right? Yeah. Oh, she's gonna go back to that grave and <laughs> go back to the grave. <laughs> I'm digging what you're saying. No, it's great. Actually, it's great. You're digging. This makes it sound like I really hated the movie, but like the end scene is the probably the best part. <laughs> it's a great scene. Barry's like, I, "Don't I, make I, me I, go I, back there, <laughs> not to the cemetery." <laughs> Poor Barry. Do you think he feels so much pressure to just like show Dong in every movie now? You know. It's like, well, Here, gotta do you know, it. Just like Mark Mark Wahlberg used to have to show his beautiful chest off. Like, if you've got that be- beautiful of a wiener, I, like, I wouldn't put, I wouldn't wear clothes. Like, if, if I had that, That's right? True. I would just go everywhere with yeah. that. It's like, I'd wear That's a kilt because, I mean, That's yeah, a great point. right. Yeah. Thankfully, I don't. I guess for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Jim, for coming back to the podcast. Oh, guys, this was fun. I can't wait till the next time. Saltburn yes. 2. Saltburn 2. <laughs> the reckoning. <Salt-burnier. laughs> Let's see what other family I can terrorize. So, Jim, Film Rage, every Wednesday. Yes. That is and correct. One day, and one day when this Korean film I saw on an airplane is available in Canada and the States, I will come on your podcast Oh, and talk you've been about it. still looking for it, hey? And you haven't been able to find it? No, not yet. And that movie is also wackadoodle, but but no uh you know no what? slurping in that one. Let me let me see. No one eats a ramen or soup. Oh, there has to be it's like a rule. You don't even have to question it. Well, I meant bathtub slurping. Yeah. Right. Ramen slurping, probably. Okay, what's the name Bath of the movie slurping. again? I know you told me once before. But the Killing it? Romance. Killing Romance? Is it a rom-com? Killing kind Romance from, of... from 2023? Yeah. Yep, still not available. Film Rage is every Wednesday. You can find Jim on social media, Film Rage YYC. Correct. Or you can just march up to Calgary and find Jim and Bryce watching movies. Yeah, we're at, we're at the cinema every week, every week. Yeah, or I may be out on the street corner with my kilt and my new. If you've got Prince one of Charles those, shirt. if you've got one of those Prince Charles shirts, Jim will buy it from you. Between the weed shop and the liquor store, with your King Charles yes. shirt. Yes, my wiener out. <laughs> Uh, Nicole and I can be found at Soundtrack Cast on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you want to talk about LL Cool J's song from Deep Blue Sea, Nicole will respond. Yeah, it's the only time I'll respond to you on Twitter is if you want to talk about the LL Cool J song from Deep Blue Sea. 
So. But come support us on Patreon. We've got a lot of fun episodes coming up. Uh, we're going to pay tribute to Steve Albini, and and I'm going to break down this Kendrick Lamar Drake feud for you. We're Only on Patreon. We're haters, and they're important in culture. It's the haters episode. Join us for that.